Welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast, where faith and sports collide. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This is episode number 55 of the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Welcome everyone to the show. My name is Jason Romano. Thank you so much for joining us here on the program today. Great to have you along with us. As always, you can download and subscribe this podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, SportsSpectrum.com, everywhere podcasts are found. We are there. We appreciate you hitting that subscribe button because basically for your device, your iPhone, your Android, your iPad, when you hit subscribe, man, that podcast just comes right to your phone. You never even have to worry about it. It's always right there waiting. And when you want to listen, it's your choice. So this podcast is that perfect example of that. And we do appreciate you checking in with us today. Our guest on the podcast today is someone I've known for a while. I met him at the NFL's broadcast boot camp. Sometime in around 2011, and uh, his last name might sound familiar. He is Jarrett Payton, and Jarrett is the son of the great, legendary, all-time great NFL player, Walter Payton. And Walter Payton, if you don't know much about his career, if you're a little younger, man, go Google Walter Payton. Watch the highlights of that guy, because from 1975 to 1987, until he retired, he might have been the best running back in football, he might be the best running back to ever play the game. There's some argument there, of course, with Jim Brown and Barry Sanders and Emmett Smith, but Walter Payton is a top three or four running back, maybe a top three or four player of all time. He was that good. And Jarrett Payton is the son of Walter Payton. And the one thing I love about Jared is that he doesn't he doesn't shy away from the legacy that his dad left and sort of being in the shadow of his dad and who his dad was. He embraces that. And he understands his dad had a giant impact on a lot of people. And uh, Jarrett wants to carry that legacy. And he did that. He played in the NFL briefly with the Tennessee Titans. He went to college and played his ball at the U, Miami Hurricanes, of course, having a great season in 2017 themselves. He was the 2004 Orange Bowl MVP, and he won a national championship in 2001 with the Hurricanes. But even more than that, Jared is now a broadcaster. You can see him in Chicago at WGN doing some great work there as well as CLTV. Jared is also a dad and Jared is also a husband. And we talk a lot about the dynamics of being a dad, being a husband, being the son of an all-time great NFL player, sort of establishing your own legacy now, you know, in your mid-30s. And Jared really is very open about his faith and open about the struggles that he's had with his faith and trusting in God and what that faith dynamic looked like as a young boy growing up with Walter Payton being an NFL player and one of the greats of all time. Was there faith in that home of the Payton household? And then what did that faith look like in 1999 when Walter Payton got sick and then unfortunately passed on from bile duct cancer. So where is faith in all of that? This is a really powerful conversation with Jared. I think you guys will love this one. Please take a listen. Without further ado, here he is, former NFL and college football running back son of the great Walter Payton. He is Jarrett Payton. Jarrett, how are you doing, my friend? Welcome to the show. JR, man, I'm doing great. Life is good, and uh, it's not too cold here in Chicago, but you know that the snow is coming, so we're we're bearing down for some of this cold weather coming here pretty soon. Oh, you know it's coming up. Same thing here in Connecticut, my friend. Same thing here in Connecticut. And listen, it's it's great to have you on the show. I've been wanting to talk to you for a while. Glad we could make this work, and, and just really excited to kind of talk through your journey, both as a dad, as a husband, as a broadcaster, as a son. Uh, and just life. And and so let's start there. Uh, before we go back in time and talk about growing up as, as the great Walter Payton's son and childhood and all that, let's talk about now. Let's talk about the dad, the husband you are, the broadcaster. What's life like right now for Jared Payton? Uh, life is, it's interesting for a kid that, you know, went to school at the University of Miami and, you know, didn't know what he wanted to do. I was in and out of majors trying to figure it out, whether it was business or whether it was communications and then I ended up getting my degree in liberal arts but I got a chance to really kind of take the courses that I thought I was going to be able to use once I you know kind of got out of college and got done even if I didn't get a chance to play in the NFL and for you know that time I got to the year I got to play with the Tennessee Titans was was a blessing but then you know after that you started to see that 
football wasn't going to last forever. You got to figure something else out. And I'll never forget in 2010, I was playing indoor football with the Chicago Slaughter here in Chicago. Just got done being in Toronto in the CFL. And I kind of knew that things were winding down. And a good friend of mine, Ernie Scatton, called me up. And uh, he worked at ESPN for, for years here in Chicago as a guy that he did everything, voiceovers, cut up sound, all that stuff. And he was at this small school in Chicago that was just starting. And he was going, man, listen, they're going to have a online radio show. Would you want to be a part of this? And I go, man, I love radio. I, I would love to do it. And I was traveling from Oswego, Illinois, to downtown Chicago, which can sometimes take you almost two hours just to get downtown with the traffic. Wow. And I was doing that three times a week. And, Jason, I didn't know who was listening. I had no clue. I didn't know if there was, you know, kind of 15 people listening, no people listening, or if there was a couple thousand. But it just became a passion of mine. And every single time that I got onto the mic – I was using it as reps to keep getting better and better. And, you know, through that time, it started to become something that I truly, truly loved and I wanted to do it more. And then the opportunity to be able to go to the NFL broadcast bootcamp where I got a chance to meet you. And, you know, from there, you you basically honestly got me on the TV side. So I want to first tell you thank you for having – for having, I tell people this story all the time, and I just got chills of just thinking about that that time of you believing in me to give me an opportunity to be on a national show. And to me, that's what really kind of kind of gave me that pinch of man. Media is my passion, and so there from there on, I had an opportunity to be able to you know be at ESPN do, uh, at the U, ESPNU for a while for that season of college football. Then I came back to Chicago and got on the airwaves with WGN. And then through WGN now, I'm the 4 o'clock sports anchor, which I fought for for years not to want to do. I'm like, that's not what I want to do with my life. And now it's become my love. And I get a chance now every single day to cover not only you know the Bears, which is my favorite team, but all Chicago sports, and it's made me a more well-rounded sports fan, and to understand you know how things work in the business, and also have an understanding of that I truly am a sports freak. I just love sports, and I can be around it all the time. It's a dream job that I get a chance to be able to sit inside of a an office and have four or five TVs in front of me and watch sports all day. I mean, <laughs> that's the coolest thing coming home and your wife going, what do you got to do? Well, I got to go downstairs and watch Monday night football. I mean, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that is, that is the dream job for most men out there. And, yes, sir. You know, and, and for me, I think, um, being a dad is, is another part of that. And I'm, I'm, I'm real still trying to balance, you know, of, covering these sports and then also having a family life because to me my family is the is the most important thing to me so and you know this business it's non-stop and they want everybody wants you to keep going all the time and for me family is what's most important so uh really trying to find that balance of watching my two kids grow up and also spending time with, with my lovely wife well let's go back now and we'll talk more about being a dad and a husband and what that looks like you know, today, later in the interview. But let's go back. Let's start from the beginning a little bit to the 1980s. You were born the son of one of the greatest football players of all time, the great Walter Payton. And I know just knowing you and knowing, you know, following you, obviously, on social media, you are not unashamed of that. You know, you're not someone that's trying to hide from the legacy that your dad maybe set. You embrace that. And you, you, you are very aware of what your dad meant to the city of Chicago, who he, what he meant to the NFL. And I love that about you. But you were seven years old when he retired from the NFL after the 87 season, 1987. What's your earliest memory of him playing in the NFL? Do you have any memories of him playing? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember, you know, the time around, you know, when he broke Jim Brown's record. And for me, that was, you know, I was really young. So, I, but I remember that day, there was so much stuff that went on that day because of just because my dad, you know, just being around the house and how much that record meant to my dad. It just, it was one of those times where, you know, he was, he worked so hard to get to that moment and to that point in his career and the, the respect 
that he had for Jim Brown and to be in that same category and your names being right by each other in the history books was something that meant a lot to me and what meant a lot to him and meant a lot to me too as a and now as a 36 year old to look back on it I mean it's a, it was it's a big deal and I, I kind of remember the Super Bowl just a little bit I think I more I more remember after the Super Bowl getting on my first private jet with my dad and Matt Suey and flying back home to Chicago I still remember that because I'd never been on a private jet before that was the first time when I was five years old so I remember that, but it is. It's hard for me to go back and think about certain games, and I was so young. And so now, at 36, I have an opportunity with the Internet and YouTube to go back and watch those games and watch films of my dad and have a better appreciation for who he was as a football player and then also to hear the stories from people that in Chicago and all over the world who he impacted their lives in some way and how he – he was off the field as a person as well. So obviously you were young when he retired, Jarrett, but he was around, obviously, as you were growing up into your adolescent years, into your teen years, just from a from a home life standpoint and faith, because this is a faith in sports podcast, faith in Jesus Christ, obviously. What does faith look like in the Peyton household as a child for yourself and your sister growing up? Your dad obviously played on Sundays until you were seven. So, But what was church like was there was that involved was that part of the like part of life as a family in the Peyton household um yes my mom made it uh, a part of our family it was something that was it was uh, nothing to mess around with and you know when it comes to you know my faith and in, in church it, it really stems from my mom and and her faith in God and what she you know, kind of try to instill in us as kids, because you think about it, Jason, it was, it's, I mean, we were kids growing up, but our dad was, especially in Chicago, I mean, people, you know, think about Michael Jordan, my dad, some lady said it to me yesterday was, you know, your dad was Michael Jordan before Michael Jordan here in this town. And so, you know, it could have been easy for both of us as kids to grow up and just think everything would be given to us and, and how we would treat people. But my mom made sure that, you know, that we were going to Sunday school and that we were learning the word and understanding, you know, God's blessing on us and why we were so blessed as a family and just as individuals, as, as kids. And, and it was a big, it was a big deal. It was always hard for my dad during that period of time, but we didn't go to a lot of games as kids. I mean, we, we did. My mom made sure and that we were in church and that we were learning the word and, and having an understanding about it. And so Sundays for us weren't about football. And I think a lot of people, it's funny you asked this and I'm glad I get to talk about it because, you know, most people just really think that we were football all the time in our family. It wasn't, that wasn't the case. When my dad came home from football, he didn't talk about football. He didn't watch football. It wasn't like I am now as a, you know, as as an adult now is like football is, is everything, you know, around our house on, on a Sunday, you know, I normally work on Sundays, so it's always hard, but you know, my son is watching football on Sundays, but we're still always trying to find that balance of making sure that our kids now have a chance to be able to understand as well. And my son goes to a Catholic school and he's really having a better understanding and learning uh, about what God means to, to our family and to what it means to his mom and dad. And so he's growing up and getting that understanding. But in our household, Jason, it was, it was everything. But my mom was the, the spearhead of making sure that uh, we were in Sunday school and in church every Sunday as possible as we could be. Yeah, I can relate in the sense that, you know, I didn't become a Christian until later in life, till I was in my 20s. But as I was working at ESPN, I was working on the NFL project, obviously, for many years. And I had to miss church on Sundays because I had to go into the office. And that killed me. And I was like, what kind of an example am I, am I being to my daughter, who was probably seven, eight, nine years old at the time? But it really just crushed me. And it's not that that I didn't love my job. I mean, like you say, we get to go and watch football on Sundays. Like nobody's going to – that's a dream job. You know, nobody's going to complain about that. But – you know, God is, is number one in my life. So for me, I struggle with that. Now as an adult with you, is that a struggle for you on Sundays, kind of balancing that? Yeah, it is. It's a it's a tough balance and we're we're trying to figure it out, especially with, you know, both 
my wife and I both work full time and, and me working on Sundays and trying to, you know, figure out how to to make that work and then also, you know, have that time together. And it is it's a balance. But over time, as our kids get older, honestly, Jason, it's getting easier and easier as they get older. I think I mean, it was hard to have little ones and and, and figuring out ways to go to church. But you know what? My my wife, though, has been she she runs our household like most <laughs> like most moms do and um you know to me to have her you know kind of she runs our schedule she makes sure she's a schedule person so to, for her to put a schedule up she makes it and when you know to have us both kind of going in the same direction and i think anytime that you you find someone that you love you guys got to be on the same on the same wavelength and be you know it's not all the time but have the same direction and with my wife you know pushing for us to make sure that we have time together and also have that church time is very very critical and i i have to kind of tip my hat to her for helping making it all work and making sure that we all stay on track not just in our everyday life but also in our spiritual life as well yeah, in many cases, we'd be lost without our wives. Ain't that the, ain't that the truth, Jarrett? We're talking to Jarrett Payton here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. And Jarrett, I want to go back again to your youth and specifically to the age of 12. And your dad was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. And you were the one to introduce him. It's, it's, it's a memorable moment. Everybody, when they talk about memorable Hall of Fame speeches, they, they go back in time to that moment when Jarrett Payton introduced his dad, Walter Payton. Do you remember that moment specifically in terms of what he, when he asked you to, to do this and what was going through your mind knowing you were going to be speaking in front of hundreds of thousands of potentially millions of people watching this speech? Yeah, I was... At first, I wasn't, I wasn't on board. I, I was, I was 12 years old. I didn't know what was going on and have the opportunity to be able to do this. And, but then as I was sitting back, I'll never forget the, uh, Hall of Fame sending a book to my house. And this is right after my dad told me that I was going to be inducting him to the Hall of Fame. And I remember opening up the book and reading about how many millions of people watch you know <laughs> these induction speeches and it freaked me out and i remember sitting down with my housekeeper miss luna who was helping me kind of put together the speech and um we just sat there and she said do you understand jared how, what this means and what this is going to mean down the line and i really had no clue because i wasn't thinking that i was going to be the first son to ever induct his father into the hall of fame and i i wasn't thinking about what it meant at that moment or i wasn't thinking about what it would mean in the future but to be able to do it was something special and that day i mean it was like i was nervous getting up to the point and you know during the beginning of that weekend it's always kind of a lot of stuff going on and as a kid i was going to all these grown-up functions and going to these dinners and it, it took up to the moment of that day that I wasn't nervous. Like when I stepped up onto the stage, I was like ready to go and I was focused. And I looked out to the crowd and saw all these people sitting out there. Plus watching my family, you know, in the front row and my grandma and what this meant to my dad. I, I started to really have the feeling of what it meant to him because as that record with Jim Brown, his other biggest thing was is to be in the Hall of Fame and to have his name amongst the greats to ever play and that it would be etched in stone forever once it was there. And that was one of his goals. And I remember us sitting down before the night before just talking about, you know, his career and everything that he went through from, you know, being in Columbia, Mississippi to making it to, you know, Jackson State and then to the Bears and then to Canton and that he was just so proud of me that I was going to be able to do this. And I think after that, that that's when the nerves went away. And I remember getting up and everybody was clapping and I, I cracked a joke. I was like, I was like, calm down, everybody. I, I'm, I need to get this over with. And everybody laughed. And after that moment, it was like just sailing through. And the one thing I always will remember is my dad giving me that huge bear hug after I got done, after I said to your fans, I want to say thank you as well. And then he gave me this big, huge hug. 
and got up and said, after hearing my son speak, cause that he made a bet who was going to cry first. And he said, after <laughs> hearing my son speak, I don't care if I lose the bet. And it was, it was that moment. And I just got chills just saying that it was that moment where I figured out, man, what did I just do? And how big is this? And now every single year that it comes around, people tweet me, they email me or saying that that is the moment that they remember about the hall of fame is that, that speech of me being a kid and man, that, that being a part of my legacy is something that's so special that I'm so blessed to be able to have. And I think about it almost every single day. I was going to ask you not just how much you think about it, but how often do you watch it? Like every so often, how, how, how regularly will you go back and, and, and watch something like that? Uh, n not that often. I don't really go back and watch it, but I do. It's hard not to look at the pictures because yeah. we have so many pictures from that day. And, you know, in my house of how you were talking about that, you see me on social media and how much I embrace, you know, being the son of Walter Payton for me in my household, I have pictures of my dad all over my house, especially in my basement in my man cave. And so that's one of those pictures that's blown up huge in my basement that has, you know, us embracing in that hug. Mm. And I look at that picture all the time because now as a dad, I get it. Like, I understand. Like, my dad was so proud of me at that moment. And that hug just symbolizes what that moment was all about. And now having my own son, I get it. Like, I, I, I get it and I understand that, man, it's... It's not about how many touchdowns you score or, you know, if your name's in the newspaper for how many goals you scored in soccer or whatever it is, yeah. you know, just being your, you know, having a dad, being a dad and seeing your son do something special like that, it, it that's what it's all about, about being a father, man. It's just being proud of your kids. And I just knew that my dad was super, super proud of me at that moment. And uh, it's a moment that I'll just never forget. Now, you mentioned soccer kind of briefly there, how many goals you score in soccer. I, I assume that's where you were going to take this because you weren't a big football kid. You didn't play football growing up for the most part until high school, right? Yeah, I I was a – man, people say this all the time. They they I've had people come up to me that get so upset with me that I – switched over to play football because a lot of people jason thought that i could have been that person that could have bridged the gap with americans because of my last name and who i was and how good i was with soccer here in the u.s wow. and as a 14 year old i wasn't thinking about that man I, I just was thinking about having a good time having fun being in high school hanging out with my friends and i remember after coming home from my I think it was, yeah, I was going into my freshman year in high school. I came home from my Europe trip with my club team, and my dad got a couple of calls from two teams that saw me play while I was over there for three weeks that wanted me to come over and uh, come back and play and work my way up. But they were talking about giving me, like, 50 grand to come over. I was 14 years old. <laughs> I'm going, what? Are you kidding me? I, I'm looking in search of money to, to buy lunch and milk at, at, at lunch. I, I could buy all the candy I want with that money. And I remember sitting there going, man, all I want to do is just be a kid. And I played nonstop soccer from four years old up to my sophomore year in high school. It was nonstop. I never stopped, especially here playing indoor when it was winter, outdoors in the summer. And, you know, it got to a certain point where, you know, I wasn't getting letters for soccer and I was playing with a kid named Nino De Silva who was the Gatorade player of the year nationally his senior year which was my sophomore year he had 45 goals 15 assists I had 35 goals and 15 assists and I wasn't a parade all-american and I was super upset and my dad told me son you got to chill like you got to keep working keep working and eventually it will come no letters, but I was getting letters from football schools, and I never touched a football and organized football in my life. <laughs> and so I just decided that maybe this might be my opportunity. Why not try it my junior year? If I don't like it, then I could switch back to soccer, and we'll go from there. And once I put on the pads and the helmet my junior year and got my butt kicked uh, like <laughs> my, junior, my junior year, I wanted to come back my senior year and show people that this wasn't a fluke, that I could do this. 
and that I could get a scholarship. And then next thing you know, man, my dad told me to sacrifice, sacrifice go, this summer going into your senior year, sacrifice, and you will have all the full rides you could ever think of. And I remember going into my senior year, I had one, one full ride to Northern Illinois, and they ended up being like 45 after my senior year. And I did. I sacrificed, you know, going out and hanging out with friends. I had a girlfriend at the time. I had to sacrifice that of, you know, going to the movies and just lived at the track and in the gym. And next thing you know, I ended up, you know, have going to the University of Miami where I had a chance to win a national championship and should have won two, but we won't talk about that one in 2002. <laughs> I may or may not have had a question about that on my uh, preps here. <laughs> But now I know I definitely don't have a question on my prep here, Jared. So we're good. We're good. Um, let me ask you this, because I wonder, it's hard for, I mean, yes, you're the son of Walter Payton, but it's its hard for me to think, man, you can just play two years of high school ball, never have played football, American football, and then be at the U. So did it just come easy for you? I mean, yeah, you had to train hard, but was it sort of natural and you could see, oh, wow, there is some God-given gifts here that I'm, I probably inherited from my dad. Yeah, I, I saw some things and I felt them on the football field, but it didn't come easy. I mean, it took some time. But for me, there was, you know, when you break it down and you really think about it, Jason, it's a, it's tough. I came from an offense in high school where I was a quarterback and basically only played one full game of running back and then played a half of running back at the beginning of the year, my senior year. And you know, I was just an athlete, so I would just, whatever I had to do, I always could run. I had good feet, but it was weird. When I got to Miami, you're putting me in the backfield, and I got to block people, which I never did before yeah. I got to Miami. I never carried the ball like I had to when I got to Miami, so it was an adjustment for me of, like, figuring out the game. And, you know, for a lot of the guys that I played with, and, you know, we see it now, these kids are, these guys are playing when they're in peewee. They've they had a jump on me from the whole time. And so it was a learning curve that I, it was hard for me to kind of grasp at the beginning. But over time, you know, things got better. But, you know, my, my freshman year in Miami was a tough one because my dad was sick at the time. So, yeah. and he, you know, he was, he was about to pass away. And I didn't know I was trying to, I was battling being a kid who was, you know, should be enjoying his freshman year, but worrying about what was going on back in Chicago. So I really couldn't focus. And, you know, I went through some dark times that year of, you know, just being very insecure and, you know, trying to either, you know, drown my sorrows and the pain that I was feeling in being out and partying and not focusing because I couldn't deal with what was going on back in Chicago when I was in Miami. So, you know, it was it was a tough, tough time for me as a 19-year-old trying to feel like everybody was looking at me. And for a kid, I tell people all, this all the time, you know, I was going through a time where my dad was passing away. And not only were we dealing with it as a family, when my dad came out and told the world what was going on, everybody knew what was going on in my life. Yeah. And so everywhere I went... I felt like people were looking at me like if I was having a great time, people were like, oh, man, he's he's just trying to mask the stuff that was going that's going on at home. But if I wasn't, then there people are like, oh, look, at, he's so depressed. And I always felt people were talking about me and judging me. And I couldn't get over that. And it was a battle that I had to battle over time. And one person that I really have to give thanks to is our, our team chaplain, Steve DeBartolabin in Miami, who was always there for me and who was always talking to me and always giving me word and understanding of what things that I was dealing with and how to deal with them. And it just was one of those relationships that like spiraled into something that was just a relationship that was, that was just unique. And lo and behold, Steve is the guy that married my wife and I, uh, when we got married. So, that you know 2009 how amazing is that from our relationship yeah. at Miami to him marrying me and my wife which is pretty special that is awesome we're talking to Jarrett Payton here on the Sports Spectrum podcast and Jarrett I had a bunch of questions about that year 1999 for you and you kind of answered many of them and just talking about the difficulties of sort of figuring that out but it was February when your dad announced that he was sick turned out to be bile duct cancer 
and then passes away November 1st, 1999. I remember that day vividly. I was just a few days before getting married myself. I just want to talk about your dad's faith a little bit, because I remember reading in the book that Don Yeager wrote about your dad in the last few months um, leading up to his death. And I just want to ask you if you could share with us sort of some of the conversations and some of the things you saw in your dad's life with regards to his faith over the last few months of his life. Well, I mean, I think if you even go back a little bit further during his playing career and a little bit of life after football, um, it wasn't church and God was not really a big part of his life. And, um, you know, I, I think he battled with it through his entire life of figuring out, trying to figure out, you know, God's plan for him. And I think, you know, a lot of things, especially at, I think the, the biggest part and the crucial point in his life when he probably needed God the most was when he was in that group that was on the brink of getting that NFL team in St. Louis, mm. because that was a big point where he thought that it was a shoe in and that he was going to be the first black owner and everything kind of spiraled out of control. And after that moment, it was like my dad's spirit was broke after that because he didn't really know what he was going to do after football. Like he didn't, I don't know if he truly prepared himself for life after football. And I think it's hard when you are one of those guys that is so big in the game when you're playing and then you become a legend right after you play and you're done playing to like have 60,000 people screaming your name to, you know, going back to walking out of your house, going to get the paper and, you know, your, your, your mailman just saying, Hey, how you doing, Walter? I mean, he, he battled with that leading up to his passing. He got back into really trying to find out what God and what God was trying to do with him and just trying to be at peace Mm. before he passed away. And, um, It was a transformation, Jason, to see him, you know, get back into the word and really truly have a better understanding. But for him to be at peace with who he was, I mean, it was like night and day from seeing the person who, you know, I watched after football struggle with finding things to bring him the same joy, you know, as running the football and scoring touchdowns to the man that was, you know, pretty close to dying and had a better understanding of who he was as a person and the impact that he had on people and, you know, what God's plan was for him and that he did what he was supposed to do, impact people's lives and, and put smiles on people's faces and bring people together. And, and it was, it was crazy because there were certain times at night I would, you know, walk in and my dad, when he was sick, he went back and forth from my room to like my, my sister's room and, you know, back in those days, my mom and dad were, you know, going through the things that they were going through as as a married couple. Sure. And, you know, being separated. And then and it was crazy that once my dad got sick, he came back to the house. And and things, my mom, just, you know, they their relationship and watching that and how that was. Because it was something that I was something that was different that I've never seen before. And them being together and them reading the Bible together. And it just was... It was something that was truly special, and I think for both of them, I think they were just really both at peace with everything that they went through through their life, through their marriage, and then to be able to come around for a circle together and to end it that way, to me, just speaks volumes about just what true love is and the power of God to be able to bring them back together again uh, before my dad passed was something that is special and something that I'll never forget. For you, 18, 19 years old, figuring out life, was there any bitterness there, I wonder? Because I know as a kid, life is hard as it is, and then kind of having to walk through this and see you know, your dad and see this happen, was there bitterness for you towards God? I know you said you kind of deviated away a little bit and kind of you know, was out partying or masking the problems, but for what, was, what kind of bitterness, if any, were there for you? Not, none really. I yeah. didn't have any, I didn't know. I, I didn't, I, I was always asking God why hmm. I, 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 I was never upset with him or, or trying to, you know, 
why did you do this to me? And, and, and it was never in any way with any hate or uh, being upset. It was more just trying to figure out why this happened. And, you know, the one thing that I truly, truly got from people that were close to me, they always just told me, you know what? You might search for that for your entire life and never find out the reason why. So yeah. you, you, you can't you can't keep kind of searching for why it happened. But through time, I started to see that what it really did in my dad's passing, it brought my family together. It, it made my mom, my sister and I very, very close. And it made me stronger as a person. And it made me stronger as a man to have to not have that father figure there. And to be able to kind of have to sometimes figure it out. But, Jason, I do have to give thanks to certain, I'd say one person that was very instrumental in that time period of my life. And that was Emmett Smith. Mm. And, and Emmett, it, it, was, it was crazy because if you listen and you go back to listen to some of these, and especially recently, Emmett's talked about it a lot, about how he had a conversation with my dad. And my dad asked him, he said, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to watch out for Jared. If he's got any questions, if he needs to talk about something, I need you to be there for him. Hmm. And and even till this day, Emmett is always there for me. Will call me just out of the blue. How you doing, man? You good? And I had a lot of people that were trying to jump into that father figure for me they wanted to be that father figure but i didn't i didn't want it forced i don't want it forced emmett just knew he was just so instrumental of being that person that would listen and call and be there and if i needed him he would a drop of a hat he would be i mean he was he was unbelievably still unbelievable and i have to thank him for how great he was to me and how great he still is to me to this day anytime that i need him to talk with him he was he was awesome, but to have that, it made it even, uh, it made it easier for me in this transition to life without dad around. And, um, you know, for me, it was, it was something that, you know, a time period I'm glad I had to go through because it's made me the man that I am today. And it must have been nice to have him be the guy that breaks your dad's record and not somebody else, and just knowing the connection that you guys had. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you. I, listen, I'm an honest person, man. I'm so I'm, I'm 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 so honest. I I wasn't I wasn't truly happy with him getting close to my dad's record. It you weren't just, feeling it, huh? No, I was not feeling it at all. I, I wasn't feeling it. But getting to know him, it it made me feel more at ease that this is a good guy that did it the right way. And you know what? He worked his tail off to get this record. And for him to show the respect to my dad, it just, that's what showed what kind of man he was. And so it put me a little bit back at ease that, listen, it's okay. And for a kid that, you know, the Internet was just becoming something. So I didn't know, you know, in 99 and 2000, I didn't know if if people were going to remember my dad yeah. 10 years after that, I had no clue. And I didn't know that the NFL man of the year award, all that stuff. I didn't know that that stuff was going to kind of catapult my dad into another stratosphere and keep his legacy alive. Because, you know, I remember sitting down with someone and they're asking me, so what do you think? Like you have a five-year plan, 10 year plan about like, you know, for your dad and like what you're going to do. I'm like, I don't know. If people are going to remember him. And, to be able to now see that he is almost bigger than life still, it's, man, it's, it's pretty amazing to sit back and think about. Well, now you get to carry that legacy on in your own family. And you talked about being a husband, but even more being a dad, being a dad to a son. So what's the biggest lesson for you, Jared, that you've learned about being a dad to your own children that you may have taken from your father? It's... You know, you take there's good things and then there's bad things that you you see through the time of growing up. And, um, you know, at, as a young kid, I I didn't have a good understanding and I didn't understand why my dad you know, was always gone. He was working all the time. He was there trying to provide for us and make sure that we had everything that we wanted. But he wasn't around maybe as much as I wanted him around. And um, that was one of the things that always I battled with and that I was upset about. 
and I fought it for a long time. And I always vowed that it wasn't that he didn't want to. It was just that the, everybody was pulling him in so many different directions. And like I said before, he didn't really know what the plan was for him. And so he was in some ways kind of lost and trying to figure it out. And for me, I just vowed as a, as a dad that I was going to be around as much as possible. And that's the biggest thing that I do now is I'm around and my kids and everything that I can be around, I'm that dad. So it's birthday parties. It's going to soccer, going to going to basketball, going to baseball, being there, help coaching, like anything that I can be at, I want to be at because I don't want to miss any moment. And it, it, I think the, the biggest lesson truly is just about love and making sure that, you know, Jaden, my son feels loved that my daughter Madison feels loved and that my wife as well is that we were, we're in this together and that we can show them that really it's all about family and God first. And if you can do put those things together and really truly have a better understanding and feel comfortable that uh, to me, love always wins. And I just want to show them as much love as possible and know that their dad is going to be at everything that he can be at and that I'm around. So they see me and um, it's truly made a difference in my relationship with with God, it's made a different, it's made a, I've seen an impact with my relationship with my wife and my relationship with my kids. I can see it every single day of the joy that my daughter sees when I come home, you know, and she runs to the door and sees me. Like, those are the things that truly make it worthwhile of, of being a dad. I want to wrap it up here with a couple more questions with you, Jarrett. But the first one I want to talk about is your foundations. I know you have your own and certainly your dad's had a foundation for many years. Tell us about the foundations you work with and uh, what impact that's making. Um, yeah, we as a family, my mom and dad, you know, started my dad started the Walter Payton Foundation. After he passed, we changed that to the Walter and Connie Payton Foundation and my mom and dad were very instrumental in making sure that my sister and I knew what it meant to give back in service. And it's been a part of our, our, our family's fabric. And it's something that I wanted to do in my own name. So a couple of years ago, I started the Jared Payton Foundation and I started an anti-bullying campaign called Project No Bull, where I go and speak to schools here in the Chicagoland area and teach kids about not the bullying, like statistics and all this stuff, but really just motivating them to be better people to themselves so they can be better people to the people around them in their communities, at their schools, and really just kind of leave an impact. And in the last two years, I've spoken to over 22,000 kids in the Chicagoland area, and so I want to keep doing that where I get a chance to really impact. And yesterday was uh, one of those days where there was a kid that asked me a question and I he was sitting next to one of his teachers and I was just telling him about, you know, a guy here in Chicago, Kevin White, who I've talked to covering the Bears. And I went up to him and just told him, a guy that's been injured his whole basically career here in Chicago. And I told him, stop worrying about why things are happening to you. you you're never going to find out the reason why like you just have to live in this moment get better and don't think about the future of you're going to get injured again but just think about getting healthy and getting back on the football field and I told this young man the almost the exact same thing and after I got done the teachers came over to me after the, all the kids left and said man you have no clue how much that kid needed that message it was like God sent you here to give him that message. He's having a hard time in school. He's 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 always thinking about what's going to happen if he gets in trouble one more time and what that can mean. And he was hanging on every single word that you said. And so, like I say, it doesn't matter if I'm speaking to 900 kids and one person gets something. Um, God gave me this gift to be able to speak and to impact people's lives. And I'm going to keep doing it as long as I'm on this earth. And you know, my dad's favorite saying to me was, you know, giving back in service is the rent that you pay while you're here on this earth. And it truly is. And I'm going to keep doing it until I'm gone. And I want to make sure that the same legacy that my dad left, my sister and I are about, you know, we walk around this city and people go, man, your dad, I remember meeting him at the grocery store and he signed this for us. Da, da, da. I want those kids that I'm speaking to at these schools in Chicago that will grow up one day and see Madison and Jada and my two kids and walk up to them and go, man, your dad impacted my life when he spoke to my school, you know, 
10, 15 years ago, that's, if I'm doing that and I can have that impact, then I'm doing what I was supposed to while I was on this earth. That's really great. Where can people find out more information on the foundation, Jerry? What's the website? They can go to jarrettpayton.org to figure out how they can either make a donation or to be involved as well, to uh, get involved as a volunteer. Or sometimes being a volunteer is more important than the money that uh, you're giving back to these foundations. But I just encourage people to not just maybe look up and see what's going on with my foundation, but there's also other great foundations out there as well. Just be a part of something because there's so many great people that are out there in this world that are doing great work. Yeah, and the greatest example of that is Christ himself who said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom. So that's really great that you're doing that, Jarrett. Last question here, and we ask this to all of our guests on the podcast, and we do appreciate your time. Right now, where you are, Jarrett Payton, 30, I'm looking at your birthday. You're almost 36. 37, 36 right now, hanging on for another month and a half or so. But what has God been teaching you during this time right now as a dad, as a husband, as a broadcaster with WGM? What are you learning from the Lord right now? I learned the biggest thing is that uh, no one's perfect. Mm. And I'm not perfect by any means. And there's going to be days that I mess up. There's going to be days that, um, you know, I'm going to have to figure it out and do something over, whether that's in the studio and whether that's at home with my kids and my family. Uh, but God keeps telling me on a daily basis that keep doing what you're doing, keep working hard, and, and just to know that he's always there. And I think that's the, the biggest thing for me is, as people, sometimes we feel like we're we're lost or we we, we don't know where to turn and we don't have anybody to talk to. But if you truly have a relationship with, with Jesus himself, you can have a better understanding of what's going to be and what's happening in your life and the purpose of your life. And, and, and for me to really have be 36 and to understand my purpose is to me is, is fulfilling for my life. I, I'm, I don't want for anything. Um, I'm not a material guy, but for me, it's it's really just having a better understanding of why I'm supposed to be here. And I truly have that, and I feel at ease, and I feel like that any time that I need to call on God to for anything, that I know that He's there, and that I'm going to to get some type of reaction of and a better understanding of why things happen, and and not to just depend on myself and. I think that's the hardest part. We always feel like we can change things as people, but we have to have a better understanding that there's a higher power. And if we do have that understanding, I think it puts us at ease just a little bit to have understanding of God's word and what that truly means and that we can truly follow that because trying to, you know, kind of handle all the stuff that's going on in this world at this moment that we see through the news and, and all these terrible things that we see, um, it will always have you searching for why things are happening. Um, God truly has the answers. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I've learned so far at this point in my life of being a dad, being a broadcaster, and just being a person that, uh, that truly wants to make a difference here on this earth. He is Jarrett Payton, the son of of Pro Football Hall of Famer Walter Payton, the great Walter Payton. And Jarrett had a pretty nice football career himself, playing professionally for a while, both in the NFL and some other areas, and excelled at running back at the U, won a national championship, runner-up a second year, the 2004 Orange Bowl MVP, but even more than that, a dad and a husband doing some great things now. Jarrett, we really appreciate you joining us. You can follow Jarrett on Twitter at Peyton Sun and on Instagram with that same handle at Peyton Sun, P-A-Y-T-O-N-S-U-N. Jarrett, thanks so much for being here on the podcast, man. It's been great catching up with you, and hopefully we'll talk again soon. No problem. I appreciate it. Anytime. And we do thank Jarrett Payton for being here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. As always, you can reach us on Twitter at sports underscore spectrum. You can tweet at me at Jason Romano, and you can find all of our content at sportspectrum.com. You can also listen to these podcasts on YouTube, on our new YouTube page. So just go to YouTube and search Sports Spectrum. And every single podcast we've released, 55 of them now, are all on our YouTube page. So check that out. And as always, you're welcome to subscribe and become a member of the Sports Spectrum family or give this as a gift to someone else 
Maybe a great Christmas idea. It's $36. That's it for the entire year. And you become a member of the Sports Spectrum family and you get our magazine and you help contribute and help fund and help produce the free content and resources that we have here at Sports Spectrum that are serving in churches, serving in youth groups all across the country. So 36 bucks, that's it. So just go to sportspectrum.com and become a member and a partner with us here at Sports Spectrum. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Have a great one, everyone.